Hey, uh, howdy. Uh, welcome, welcome to Country Fellowship. If we've not yet met, I'm Bill Rector. I'm the teaching pastor. Before we get started, happy Veterans Day. And one of the things that we would like to do... Um, yeah, we, you know, we're not trying to embarrass anybody, but i got to tell you something. Freedom isn't free. If you have at any time in your life served in any of the branches of the United States Armed Forces, would you please stand or raise your hand and allow us to honor and thank you properly? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and God bless you. I enjoy the freedom of being able to tell bad jokes from this podium because of the work that you've done. Uh, we actually, we enjoy great religious liberty in our country. And as we said, freedom isn't free. And for those of you who paid some price for the rest of us, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so here we are now as that time of our, our worship when we, we open God's word. And we're going to now start a brand new chapter. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> For the next several years, we'll be in Luke chapter 8. <laughs> well, I feel like that too, because we're, we're getting into one of the juiciest sections here, this great parable today that we're going to study. But, but let, me, let me open God's word, if you will. Luke chapter 8. We'll be studying verses 1 through 15, and we're going to be doing this at least over two days, at least. Uh, so two Sundays. So let's... Let's see how this reads, shall we? Luke 8, verse 1. After this, Jesus traveled from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on the rock, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than what was sown. Then he said this. He called out, he who has ears, let him hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to others I speak in parables, so that though seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rock are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by perseverance produce a crop. Thus beloved is the word of the Lord. I, uh, I think all of us have heard this parable many times. It's pretty interesting. And actually, you know what, before, before we get into it, there's three verses that kind of are meant to be transition before this gets started, but there's something kind of interesting in them. So let me, let me go back before we get too far into this. You, you might have noticed that, it, that at the beginning of chapter 8, there's like a transitional verse. It's, it's meant almost as a literary, literary device, you know, like you would read in a story that said, and the months rolled by and nothing happened until, right? It's kind of like that. Boy, there's something really interesting here. It, it talks about Jesus traveling from town to town, preaching the good news of the kingdom of God, 
and that the 12 were with him, and that doesn't surprise us at all. But there is a verse that should, and at least it jumps out at me, and it said, and also some women were with them. And the reason that that jumps out, it, it, it shouldn't maybe jump out to us in our 21st century, but in the first century, this would have been a really odd thing to talk about. I'm sorry, ladies, I have to apologize this, but in the first century, women were property. They were not permitted even to testify in court because they were not considered rational enough to give evidence. I'm, again, I apologize for that. <laughs> but the group that has done more to change that throughout history has been the Church of Jesus Christ. When the equality of men and women before the throne of God has been rightly understood as led by Jesus Christ, Christians have led to more equality for women in the world than any other agency. And even though we have issues that we haven't all figured out, you can look at other countries absent the teaching of Jesus Christ where women are still fighting for the right to drive or to not be treated as property. And so I think this is a really important verse that Luke mentions. There's no other reason to mention this right here. It could be perhaps that he's setting this up for a witness later because Joanna and Mary Magdalene are mentioned later as witnesses right after the resurrection of Jesus. But I think more than anything, he's mentioning to us that these are women, and, and I really like the fact that he points out that these women were helping support them out of their own means. They, they were making active and vital contributions to Jesus' ministry, and that was a revolutionary thought then, and something that those of us who understand our Christian heritage can be proud of and hope to carry on. Amen? All right. Thank you. There we go. But then verse 4 begins with this, this famous parable. Do we have that graphic? Julie, do you have the... I love this. This kind of cracks me up. Maybe it's because such a friendly little seed there. This is, this is a parable that you've heard so many times. It's called the parable of the sower. But you know, really, it's really more of a parable of soils, of four different kinds of soils. So you, we could call it the parable of the soil. It occurs in Matthew, in Mark, and in Luke. And, and it actually... Because it is more than just teaching, there's an event that occurs here. This marks a point in time where Jesus kind of changes a little bit the focus of his ministry. And so the event of this, which is in Mark chapter 4, and it's in Matthew chapter 13, and here it is in Luke chapter 8, gives us a way to kind of line those Gospels up. And they all tell this parable virtually the same way. There's a couple of reasons why this is so powerful. First of all, it provides us information. There's some things that we always wonder about. Why is it that some people don't receive the gospel? And why is it that I heard this when I was 16 and I didn't respond to it? Right? This helps to answer that question. It's informational. But it also tells us a little bit about the teaching style. So it's, it's knowledge that we need, but it's also about how we learn that knowledge. And that's why this parable is so valuable and it's worth us spending at least a couple weeks studying, okay? So from a standpoint of information, if you're following the Lord Jesus around, and you were back with him, and you were one of his disciples, you've seen him heal people. You've seen him raise people from the dead. You've seen him openly declare, according to the teaching of Isaiah 61, that he is uh, the Messiah, God, right? He calls himself the Son of Man. You know, because you've received his word, if you're one of the 12, or if you're one of these women that's followed him, you know who this is, and you have to be asking yourself, why isn't everyone believing him? And by the way, as a Christian, is that not a thought that's occurred to us occasionally? When we witness to a neighbor or a friend, fill in the blank. Why is it that this has been such transformational love and forgiveness and freedom for me, and my neighbor needs it so desperately, and I, I can't even start up a conversation with him. And Jesus is going to answer that question. It's really important. It explains what we all have seen, and that is the variation that occurs. Why some people hear this, and it goes right over their head, and other people, it changes their life. But it also represents a teaching style. It tells us something about how we learn from the word of God. You know, up until this point, Jesus had explained from the scriptures who he was. In his ministry going to synagogues, he would teach from Isaiah 61. 
So, you know, this is, this is who I am. I have been anointed to preach good news to the captives. And he'd say, that was my mission. But from now on, it appears he's going to change the focus. And he's going to teach in a different way. And this is really interesting. There is a certain paradoxical truth that accompanies Christian teaching. Let me see if I can explain it with a couple of examples, and you'll kind of understand where Jesus is going with this. I remember as a young man, I was a supervisor and a manager, and I, we were learning that one of the things that they try to teach you is you have to be objective. As a, as a, if you're managing people, you have to be objective to hearing both sides of the story, etc. And I'll never forget being absolutely staggered by this statement. The key to being objective is to admit that you are subjective. And I was just, that seemed like such a paradoxical truth to me. And let's see if I can explain what I mean. The key to being open to hearing many sides of a story is to admit that I bring a bias to that story and that I am not objective. Does that make sense? That's weird, isn't it? But is that not true with a lot of the paradoxical truths of biblical? You know, the key to accessing the riches of God, we've said over and over again, is recognizing that you are spiritually broke and declaring your own spiritual bankruptcy. As soon as you realize that you are at the bottom floor, that's when the doors of the elevator get open up and you can get off. Right? That's why Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. They know they're there. Some of us are still hanging on to our pride before that happens. The key to salvation and being saved is being broken to the point where you know you need a savior. See, if you're not, then you just, you need a helper. You need like a life coach or a workout coach. What do they call those people? Personal trainers. You can tell I use that a lot, right? Uh, (laughs) Really, our school had a fun run the other day. I objected to the name just from... (laughs) I jogged to the snack bar and that's it. Um, (laughs) my idea of exercise is to fill a tub with some water, get some Gatorade, pull the cork, brace, and fight the current, right? That's (laughs) as far as I need to go with that. Okay, where was I? I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm here through Sunday, by the way. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the, some of these paradoxical truths, the key, the key to knowing that you're needing, needing something begins with this idea. And so it is now. Is it any wonder that the same is true with what, what we're called here is the knowledge of the kingdom of God? The, the, actually, the quote is the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God. Is that any wonder that the key to knowing those things would be to admit that you know nothing? To begin with that. And that these things would be hidden in plain sight for us. And that's what I think Jesus is going to do with these parables. He's going to say, I want to teach these things. This isn't code. These are not special words or Morse code or any kind of, you know, binary logic here. This is a story that if you're not looking for it, you'll miss it. And if you are looking for it and your heart is open to it, you'll never miss it again. There's a friend of mine who's in the fire extinguisher business. And and there's lots of jokes there, but I've used up my allotment for the day. But I I, I walked around with him one time for an afternoon at our school where he takes care of our fire extinguishers. You know, those things require periodic care, I found out. You know, you have to make sure they're charged and tagged. And he does that. And he can walk into a room and say where the fire extinguishers are, according to the code and where he's learned. Now, this room is a little different because houses of worship are a little bit more decorative. But throughout any public building, you know, if we walked into a Kmart or a Walmart, he could say, there's one, there's one, there's one. He says, and you know, you just, it, you get to the point where you see it automatically. I never notice where they are. But now after spending a few hours with him, I, I begin to notice them all. And then you can actually walk up and see whether they've been charged recently or not or when they're due to have that happen. And that's, that's his business. This is kind of the same thing. It, it, once you know where to look for the truth of God, once you've been taught where to look for it, you can't miss it. It's all over the place. And you're, why did anybody else miss it? But walking through life, maybe with our head down in our phone, you'll never see it. It's hidden in plain sight. And so that is what we're going to do. And Jesus is going to introduce us to a new phrase for the very first time. He's going to say, he who has ears, let him hear. Meaning, if you're tuned in and you're listening, what I'm saying will educate you and it will nurture you. But if you don't, you won't even hear it. Okay? So, 
Let's begin. Verse 4 says, While a large crowd was gathering, and people were coming to Jesus from town after town. Well, that's certainly true. That's certainly true. But Matthew and Mark add a little bit more to this. They actually say that this teaching was done uh, seaside, if you will, or really lakeside, in the Sea of Galilee. Both Mark and Matthew say that the crowds following Jesus were so big that he actually had to step into a boat and go about 20 yards off in, into the, the lake and use the, the shore of the Sea of Galilee as a natural amphitheater. And this is something that he did from time to time. That's actually quite ingenious, acoustically as well, if you're ready for some nerd material on that. The bouncing of the echoes off the water would actually improve your acoustics from doing that. So uh, the Lord, being an acoustical engineer as well as the savior of humanity, well, he discovered that, and he went out and he did that. So now Luke doesn't tell us that. Does that mean he's lying? No, this is, this is not a conflict in the gospel. Luke's just providing an, an edited version of this. And then he, he tells us, let's see here, that he told this parable, a farmer went out to sow his seed. And it's interesting because in this parable, it's not the farmer, we don't know who the farmer is. And both Mac, Matthew and Mark and, and Luke all, they don't, they don't identify the farmer as God. Even when Jesus is explaining the parable later, he doesn't say that this farmer is God. And in some parables, the farmer, the person sowing the seed is God. That means that this farmer, this could be when God was trying to sow the seed in our heart, or it could represent a friend who'd been trying to sow the seed into your heart for a long time, and it could also represent you that are trying to sow the seed into your loved ones. So the farmer is a generic farmer so that we can see ourselves in that role and other people that have been in our life. Now Jesus does make it clear that the seed is the word of God. That's really important because there's no interpretation there. It's just plain as the seed is the word of God. That's the seed that comes directly from God. And if in the end, there is really nothing else that is transformational and nothing else that, is, that, that lasts over time like God's word. You know, we, we talk about this from time to time. I don't know what pastors do who, who don't preach from the Bible. I, I, really, I don't know what they do. It must trouble them every week to think of a new subject to talk about. And I cannot think of anything that I have more valuable to give you than the Word of God written down 2,000 years before I was born. And that's why, that's what we do here. We just open it up, we read it, we try and explain it, we talk about it, we try and understand it, because it changes hearts. But there is kind of an interesting process to it. You, you hear this in the parable of the sower. And maybe you heard it in my prayer before I got up here. You know, our worship time together, it opens our hearts. Our, our, then sings my soul, the song said, right? So it, it's kind of, you know, agriculturally, this time of worship prepares the soil. You know, this is the only church in the country where I can encourage you to get plowed before the sermon. <laughs> Metaphorically speaking, of course. <laughs> Spiritually speaking, right? And, and, and the whole, that's what we do. We, we, we want the Lord to, to tear up our hearts and make that, make that ground soft so it would be receptive to his word, and then we pour his word into it. He tells us, as the farmer was scattering seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and birds of the air ate it up. Luke adds the trampling. Matthew, Mark don't add that. They just, the seed fell along a place where it was not going to get into the soil. It had been packed down along the path. It was almost like it had fallen on a sidewalk, right? And the birds of the air eat it up. But Luke adds the fact that it was trampled, and I think by that he's suggesting that the people who pass by, to some degree, actually almost have a disrespect for it. If, if you don't appreciate God's word, there's a, ten, there's a disrespect for it. Uh, we've seen that in our culture, have we not? And I honestly believe that we're not the first people to see that, that, that this is happening before. People who do not understand the truths of God. It, it, the Bible tells us the wisdom of God is what? Foolishness to man. So they disrespect it, they trample it. Some fell on rock when it came up and the plants withered because they had no moisture. So we, we have some that fell on hardened, packed down soil like it had fallen on uh, a, a sidewalk. 
Some fell on a rock. Now, the rock really is, if we, we read Matthew and Mark, they can help us. This is kind of rocky soil. And the whole idea was that it, if you've ever walked around the area of Jerusalem and the area around Judea, you probably can see there's lots of rock there. And sometimes you'd have rock that was just a couple inches below the surface and maybe an inch or a very thin layer of soil on top. That's what this is referring to. The seed can actually sprout there and germinate, and it tries to put roots down. You know, plants desperately need a big root system. If you've ever tried to tear up weeds or dandelions in your garden, you know that one of the reasons the dandelion is such a successful weed is the roots sometimes go down two and three times as tall as the height of the plant above ground. An apple tree, fully mature, which can take anywhere from 10 to 15 years, has an identical mass of roots below the surface of the ground as it does bark and wood above. And so this is what plants try to do. They try to put down roots. Why? Because that's where the moisture will always, there's a continual source of moisture and nutrients there. Now, of course, it rains above ground. That's great, but it doesn't always rain. You know, you just have to live in North Texas a few years to see that. There's times when it floods, and then there's times when you go months without it. So the stability of the plant depends upon a deep root system. If it doesn't have that because there's rock a couple of inches below the surface, then it has to start growing up. So it, it really, it looks interesting. This plant tries to grow roots down. It reaches a barrier. So then it has to grow up, and it looks like it's sprouting very quickly in that regard. But there's a problem there. And this is when the sun comes out, it scorches it because it does not have a lasting source of water. And this is, this is what we're talking about when we talk about that the, the sun fell on the rock and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. That's, that's what we're really talking about there. And then the other seed, verse 7, had uh, fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plant. These, these are, the, think of these thorns as weeds. It's a generic word that could have meant weeds and thorns and thorn bushes and things like that. And in this case, at the difference is before, there was a, a physical rock barrier that prevented the, the roots from going deep. And here, there's competition. Right? Maybe it's actually great soil to grow stuff, but there's other stuff already growing there. There's competition for the attention of moisture and nutrients. And, and I hope you can, you can pick up what I'm saying here. This is where the competition for the other things in our heart takes away this. But then, uh, in verse 8, still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than it was sown. Uh, this is also interesting when you compare the versions in Matthew and Mark. Both uh, Mark and Matthew mention 30, 60, and 100 times. Right? Um, Luke just mentions 100. I mean, the, the point to Luke is this is your winner right here, and it produces a big crop. But I think it is interesting that, it, that even the successful seed in the good soil may have various depths of crop or, or various amounts there. So I think we see that. And then he called out. And he said, he who has ears, let him hear. And this is the first time we hear that. The first time we hear that. And that tells us that there's something about the teaching that is different. And this, this is... Why would the Lord hide these truths? Well, I don't think he's really hiding them. If he wanted to hide them, he could just speak in code. Right? But I do think that his disciples asked him, what does this parable mean? Now, honestly, this is not that difficult to interpret, is it? Well, for you and me, it isn't. Because we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And, and we have God's Word, right, written down to explain it. But his disciples were like, what does this mean? And he said in verse 10, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of, heaven, of God has been given to you. But to others, I speak in parables so that though seeing, they may not see. Though hearing, they may not understand. And this has given people a lot of trouble over the years. I think in our time here in this parable, I think one of the things that we're going to see is sometimes people interpret this parable as towards one's salvation. 
rather than what I believe it really means, which is how we receive truth from the Bible. Now, it is important. If you receive no truth from the Bible, you cannot be saved. Luke tells us that. But in these other conditions, these are things that experienced believers, people who've been walking with the Lord a long time, have told you, yeah, I see that in my life. And so I don't think that we are meant to interpret ourselves as ending up in one and only one of those four squares. Can we put my, my chart back up there again? The, uh, yeah, I, I don't think we see ourselves as either any just being in only one of those. I think people who've been walking with the Lord a long time will tell you, each of these things has happened to me in my life. I recall a time, I'm sure that the gospel was preached to me as a boy in my hometown church, but I, I never honestly remember ever hearing it one time. In, in fairness, maybe it wasn't preached clearly. You know, I, I don't know, but I could never be critical of my hometown church because it's just, they might as well be throwing the seed on, on top of a Teflon, right, for me at that time. I knew everything. I should be teaching. And it's ironic that after being broken, now God has brought me to the point where I am. But it was after being broken. So uh, I remember times when I wasn't listening. I remember times where the seed of the Word of God bounced right off of me. And this is something that other Christians remember as well. I remember times when I would receive it like the rocky soil and I would have immediate joy and then it just something would happen. There'd be persecution or I'd have to do something that was a little too hard and it kind of faded away. It didn't really take at that moment. Now, I can also remember, this is, this is troubling for me even today, the competition for my attention, for everything, right? So when, when new biblical truth comes to us, any one of these four things can happen to us. And so I don't think this is a parable that is unique and only describes one's salvation. I think if you look at your own experience and you look at your life and your walk with God, this describes how we take in information from the Bible. Amen? Now, clearly, Luke will tell us, if you're in that first place and you never get any word from God, you cannot be saved. And I do agree with that. But he never says that about any of the other conditions. So I think one of the mistakes here is that people tend to look at this parable as though it is you as a human being are going to end up in one of those four categories and it tells us that there's only one of them down there, the good one, that you're going to heaven. And I, I think that's way too rigid. I think this describes a continuum of our experience learning from God. But one of the reasons they get confused is because Jesus says this parable. He quotes Isaiah chapter 6. And he says, though seeing you may not see, though hearing you may not understand. And Matthew will go on and quote the whole verse from Isaiah. And this verse from Isaiah is not a happy one. It's a judgment that God is pronouncing on Israel. But, but I, I think that there's more to it than that. I think part of what we're seeing is it's not that the Lord desires that people would not hear and not be saved and not listen. I think he's saying this is a reality. I'm absolving you as farmers from you can sometimes not do anything about the condition of the soil when you're farming. Right? You can't. You can continue to sow in the lives of your loved ones, your friends, and you see no response for years and years and years. And then something happens and all of a sudden there's a, there's a glimmer of hope. And if you've seen that, then you realize we must absolve ourselves of, of the condition of the soil of the other person. The only thing we do is we keep throwing it out there and we keep making sure it's consistent with, deeply rooted in the Word of God. And I think that's what Jesus is saying. Is don't worry that they're not going to understand. There are times when people are just simply not going to understand. But there is something. You know, Matthew goes on to say this. He, he, when Jesus is explaining that the knowledge of the kingdom, the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given to you. He, Matthew goes on to say this, whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. And whoever does not have, even what little he has will be taken from him. And this is a really difficult truth, but it's an absolute true thing that, that I think as Christians we can relate to. <laughs> uh, they, they used to say Lay's potato chips, where, where you, could, you can't just eat one, right? 
And there's something about the truth of God's Word. We need it so badly. We connect with it. And with it, we are fed, literally. Not something perhaps more nutritious than a Frito-Lay product, okay? No offense. And not only do we receive nourishment from that, but there's a desire for more. There's a hunger for God's Word. That's, I believe, why some of you keep coming back. It's because we, deep down, are made to desire God's Word. And as we feed that, that desire grows. But there's, a, there's an unfortunate other side to that coin. And that is, if it's been a while since we've taken in, really taken in the Word of God and let it transform us, then not only do we miss the knowledge, we, we lose sometimes even our appetite for it. And that's, this is what Matthew's saying. Those of us that have will be given more. We find ourselves desiring even more of God's Word. Those who don't, even the little light they've been given might be taken from them. So as we, we close for today, and there's more to study here, but as we close for today, what a joyful and thankful thing that we have received this. You know, if you're sitting here and you wonder what this parable means, it's because God has already lifted a veil. And you've already been one of those people that's discovered it. I mean, it, it, it is absolutely true that the secrets of the kingdom of God have been presented to you. And in the same way that we felt privileged that people defended us and set out freedom for us, we should feel so privileged that we are among those that are, are aware of and, and have access to this knowledge, the secrets of the kingdom of God. I don't know why. God was so merciful as to let me in on some of these things. I really don't. It is not. It has nothing to do with my intelligence, which is questionable to begin with. My wife, were she here, could testify to that for hours. So we, we just remain so thankful. And, and we look at this, and we should look forward. Applying it to ourselves first. How? How is it, God, that I can take in more of your word? How can I avoid these things that keep me from taking in your word so that that crop in my own heart will grow stronger and stronger? Father in heaven, thank you so much that you have you've changed our hearts and you continue to. The condition of the soil is different today than it was 20 years ago, and I'm so thankful. Please continue to change our hearts. Open us. You know, your word says that you will take away our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh so we know that you do this. And please continue to do that. Do this in our lives so that we may take in more of your truth. But, Father, also do this in the lives of our loved ones. And then let us be a source of the distributing the seed. Give us that spirit to continue to farm and distribute that seed to our loved one. I thank you for entrusting us with the secrets of the kingdom of God. Thank you for again and again, however many times you've sowed into my life and our lives. You've treated my soul like a garden. And there were times when I, I treated it like a garbage dump. But you continued to sow, and you tended it along the way. And I'm so thankful. I give you thanks and praise on behalf of all God's people. Amen.